Are you good to go? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bruno Duperon. I'm very pleased to chair this session entitled Punishing Migrants, Critical Perspectives and Implications. And so it's great to have here uh, three speakers going to uh, share with us um, apparently stimulating uh, research and findings. So first we have uh, Afzalur uh, uh, Rahman. Uh, Afzalur teaches international relations at the University of Chittagong in Bangladesh. And he has completed an, an undergraduate and also a graduate program uh, in international relations from the University of Chittagong in 2012 and 2013. He did a master's thesis on irregular migration from Bangladesh to Malaysia causes and consequences. And his research interests include uh, irregular migration, trafficking, drug smuggling, refugees, and geopolitics. So uh, Avzalur, welcome to this panel. Uh, next, we have uh, Vittoria Gualberto Vaggetti. Uh, she's a law student uh, at the Pontifical Catholic, uh, sorry, uh, at the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná at the Campus Maringa in Brazil. And her research includes um, uh, several topics, including uh, uh, immigrants, narco-traffic, arts, international law, and diplomacy. So, uh, Vittoria, uh, welcome to this session as well. And uh, finally, we have uh, Yukari Ando. Uh, and Yukari Ando is a guest associate professor at the Osaka School of International Public Policy at Osaka University in Japan. Her main research is the deportation of foreigners under international human rights law with special focus on the principle of non refoulement And the current research interest is the comparison among European Convention on Human Rights and EU directives, as well as ICCPR and Convention Against Torture how the respective courts and quasi-judicial committees decide the test of the jurisprudence. So Yukari, welcome to this session. So uh, I'm very pleased also to, to have uh, uh, attendees here in this panel. And so what I would like to propose is that uh, we'll have uh, 15 minutes for each uh, speaker. <coughs> uh, if you have some questions, then um, uh, please keep them toward the end of the session. We'll have all the sessions at the same time after all the presentations. Um, <clears throat> and so one thing I, I suggest as well is that I'm, when you present, I'm going to turn off my camera. And uh, when you have just one minute left, I'm going to turn it on so that you'll have uh, you know, uh, an indication that you have one minute left. So then consider wrapping up your presentation. Does it sound good? Any questions? No, that's good. So um, uh, is it okay if Vittoria starts and then Yukari and finally Avzalo? Is it okay in that order? Yeah, okay. Yes, it is absolutely okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Yukari, you're fine with that as well? Sorry, is it okay if you, if you yeah, present a second? Course. Yeah, okay, awesome. Well, well, thank you very much. All right, perfect. So, Vittoria, you can start and you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon. It is an honor to participate in this event with speakers of such high level willing to share their experiences and research. I would like to thank especially the organizing committee of the Canadian Association for the Study of Forced Migrations and Refugees for this opportunity and for all their support. I, my name is Vittoria Goberto Vajetti. I am academic of law at the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná, Campus Maringá, Brazil. And together with my advisor, Luciana Caetano da Silva, PhD candidate in law at the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná, master in law by the State University of Maringá, 
an associate law professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Paraná Campus Maringá, Brazil, researched on violence against immigrant families and Brazilian diplomacy, and the team of this presentation. Immigrants are historically responsible for many transformations in Latin America, especially in the composition of Brazilian population. Physical and psychological violence are one of the concerns in the, in the immigration scenario. A solution found in, in borders regions was diplomatic dialogue, both in the regional and in multilateral aspects. Um, specific approaches were adopted in this study, which are migration and geographic changes, historical background of Brazilian diplomacy, violence against immigrant families, legal order, public policies, and the pandemic scenario. The problem observed was a lack of a unified and detailed action plan covering the entire national territory. The organ this year, the Organization of American States claimed in a report about human rights in Brazil, the difficulty of the country in establishing a cooperation plan with other federative entities. Gorgeous laws are uh, projected in papers, suffer from problems of practical implementation in daily operations. The, why do, does the federal government significantly prioritize operations in a specific state and city? The majority of the applications for the refugee status are submitted from the state of Roraima, specifically from Pracaraima city. Um, in this year, actually, and there were, there were 3,095 applications in the month of August, out of which, 2,531 came from the state of Roraima, and 2,342 from, from Pacaraima city itself. The numbers mainly made up of Venezuelans because the, state, the Brazilian state of Roraima has a large border with Venezuela. The main operation in Brazil is called Reception Operation, created in April 2018 when the number of Venezuelan immigrants were raising, and it works in four principal structures, registration, healthcare, humanitarian shelters, and relocation to other states. It is a volunteer relocation for family reunion or for social reunion, for job opportunities or for receiving help from a specific institution. When it comes to the families from other locations, they are protected by the legal order, um, shaped mainly by the immigration law and the federal constitution, by social projects, protected by also secretaries of the cities, government of states and ministries of the federal government. On the other hand, it is not enough. Uh, immigrant families undergo violent experiences. According to Oxford Dictionary, violence is an act of physical violation or moral intimidation. And the word to describe this violence in Brazil is intersectionality, which is the connection of different types of oppression altogether, such as layers of vulnerability according to immigrants, origin, nationality, economic conditions, gender, because considering that women are in charge of unequal household functions. In July 2021, out of the 8,311 people in the shelters in Roraima, 1,913 were women ahead of their families. Another factor is gender. The notwithstanding the experience of higher unemployment rates because of their, their AIDS, uh, 148 elderly people in the shelters were head of their families. 
and unaccompanied children were subjects of 28% of the registrations for a refugee status in Brazil in August 2021. Race, but on indigenous, are historic collectors, and 59% of immigrant radons kept this way of living in Brazil, many of them collecting alms in the traffic lights. Considering the data resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, around March 2020, then the, there were ordinances limited the entrance of immigrants in Brazil, the number of immigrant registers fell to 50%. And 77% of immigrant children in Roraima were out of school because, because the classes were suspended or they did not, did not have access to the internet. This research proposes reflections upon solutions to the problem. It especially involves diplomatic actions in order to change the conception of migration of migration crisis to migration of crisis, nationalize the plan, and in order to amplify the importance of international conventions in public policies. But you may ask, why diplomacy? By the beginning of the 12th century, a Brazilian diplomat revolutionized the operation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Brazil, Baron of Rio Branco. He was responsible for consolidating the Brazilian borders without resorting to any armed conflict, only through diplomatic dialogue. From then on, the ministry were responsible for extracting the national values of Brazil with Berta Luz fighting for human rights in the conference of San Francisco in 1945, Sergio Vieira de Mello, who was responsible for the successful protection of 37,000 Cambodian refugees and many others. Diplomats in Brazil were responsible for the analysis, analysis of hundreds of requests for exceptional permission of entrance of immigrants during the pandemic and coordinating the repatriation of Brazilians who were abroad. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, so we'll uh, move on next to uh, Yukari. Yukari, um, if you want to uh, turn on your mic and camera, and uh, I, I don't know if you have slides. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, you have 15 minutes, Yukari. Okay, thank you very much. And good afternoon. Actually, now 5.30 in the morning in Japan, and it's very, very early morning for me. And I hope my brain can work properly. Okay, so today I would like to present about prolonged immigration detention in Japan. Um, the, my research question is whether the state party like Japan has an obligation uh, to protect the detainee under the International Covenant on Civilian Political Rights. And especially Article 9 of the ICCPR says, everyone has the right to liberty and security of persons, and of course no one shall be subject to arbitrary arrest or detention. And also paragraph 4 said, proceedings before court, detention should be uh, entitled to take proceeding before court. So that is the criteria which I would like to uh, focus for this presentation. So this is the uh, status of residents in Japan. If you are not classified uh, the status such as the uh, work permit or status regarding 
few of uh, family status, like a spouse of Japanese national or child of Japanese national or designated activity, which is quite um, variety of the status. If you are applying for the refugee status, you can be uh, entitled to take this design this activity. And this designing the activity is with work permit and without work permit. So if you apply for refugee status, when you had a legal status, you might given the designing activities with work permit. But if you uh, legal status uh, already expired and you applied for refugee status, you might given the design activities without work permit. And also another status such as students, if you are uh, studying a school or university in Japan, you can give a work permit, uh, the status, but without work permit. But if you apply for the special status, you might give them the 28 week, per, uh, sorry, 20, 28 hours per week, even you are student with work permit. So if you violate these uh, status, of course you can be uh, illegal. And actually we are using the term illegal many times. We do not really uh, use the irregular or undocumented, but we use illegal alien. So which is quite uh, crucial because this year, the United States Biden administration uh, declared they do not use the term illegal alien anymore. But Japan, we still use the term illegal alien. And if you violate the Immigration Act, you might be uh, detained. And uh, if you violate a certain uh, level of the Immigration Act, you uh, deportation procedure start. And if your deportation procedure starts, you are detained in principle until the day of the deportation. And your detention is unlimited until the day of the deportation. And if you apply for the provisional release, you might be released provisionally because det detention is until deportation is possible. And sometimes your detention is prolonged more than a uh, year and years. And this is the statistics before COVID-19 as of June 2019. So we have the two big detention center. One is near Tokyo, Ushiku, and uh, another is the western part of Japan, Omura. So Ushiku and Omura is the two largest detention center. And another regional immigration bureau, Tokyo, Nagoya, Osaka, and others. And all together, before COVID-19, we did have 1,253 detainees. And if you look at how long they are detained, Actually, the more than three years, 76. And most of them detained Ushiku and Omura, which are two largest detention center in Japan. But more than three years means some people detained like seven years. And why they detained such a long time? Because they denied to be deported and uh, they are not released provisionally, therefore they detained more than three years. And this prolonged immigration detention is 
the argued, which is, it might be violated uh, ICCPR and other international human rights conventions. And because of COVID-19 pandemic, as of December 2020, the detainee uh, number uh, decreased. Altogether, 346 persons. And uh, more than six months, 207 persons out of 346, which is quite a uh, num uh, quite number. And why the number of detainees decreased because of COVID-19? And they released provisionally. They got a provisional release. But uh, those people are not released, even the provisionally. And of course, they cannot be deported because of some uh, uh, international borders crossed till date. And this is one of the arguments which came from the Human Rights Council Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. They uh, adopted the opinion to uh, detainee uh, applied the violation of arbitrary detention, and then the working group declared it clearly violated of international human rights, especially Article 9 of ICCPR. And actually, the uh, many detainee dead at the immigration detention center. And one of the big tragedy happened uh, June 2019. Nigerian man died of starvation at Omra detention center, the western part of Japan, Nagasaki, after he took the hunger strike. He uh, he was the fourth of Japanese national, and he had a child in Japan. That is the reason why he didn't want to be deported to his country, because he wanted to be uh, with his child. But he violated the Immigration Act, and he was detained. And he was detained for a long time time he went to on strike a hunger strike and finally he died for the starvation and after his death the immigration service agency uh, investigated the reason and uh, and he as uh, the immigration service agency published the final report on the investigation on the death of his uh, incident but this report didn't really uh, clearly uh, analyze what is the main reason why he died so that is one of the uh, difficulty because of the immigration agency themselves investigated and they didn't really uh, accept the outsider for the investigation. That is one of the challenges. Why the immigration agency didn't want to accept the third party. And another death happened this year. The Sri Lankan woman died uh, March 2021, this year, and she couldn't get adequate medical treatment at the detention center. And she asked many times a uh, drip infusion because she couldn't eat for her uh, health condition. But her request was not accepted, and in the end, she died. And actually, she was a victim of domestic violence by her Sri Lankan intimate partner. And she went to uh, the rescue 
to the police station near her house, but she was overstayed and she was detained. And because of the uh, COVID-19, she couldn't uh, go back to her own country. And also she was the, not be able to go back to her country because her former intimate partner uh, warned when she go back to Sri Lanka, she might be killed. So she was really uh, uh, threatened to go back to Sri Lanka because of her former intimate partner. And Immigration Service Agency published her uh, death for the investigation and mid report and final report. But there are some uh, differences between mid report and final report because some uh, facts were not written the mid report. And even she clearly asked to go to the hospital, but Mid report said she never asked to go to the hospital. And this is the number how many people death at the immigration center since uh, 1997 till this year. Quite many number of the detainees were dead in the immigration detention center. And this year, Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act bill was the, uh, submitted, uh, uh, the bill was requested, but many protests happened by civil society. And finally, this year, May, the bill was withdrawn. And why uh, the bill was uh, supposed? The aim of the amendment bill was to resolve the prolonged detention. But actually, this bill was uh, really argued by the UNCR and other agencies, and of course, some uh, uh, civil societies. Because compulsory detention policy is not a chance for the bill. And supervised major system instead of provisional release is not alternative to detention. And violation of the principle of non human and misuse of complementary protection was issued for the immigration bill. Actually, I don't have much time to be left to explain about the details, but the concern of the uh, expert about Bill, for example, joint statement on special reporter was the really um, arbitrary detention was the concern by the special reporter, and also UNCR comment on the bill was quite uh, uh, severe. They criticized about the bill. For example, complementary protection is uh, misused, totally different from international standard of the complementary protection. Because complementary protection under the immigration bill was uh, persecution. They require the persecution, but the complementary protection never asked persecution, being persecuted. So complementary protection in international standards is irreparable, uh, irreparable serious harm if deported. But the uh, proposal bill is totally different terminology. I mean, the concept. Terminology is the same, but the concept is totally different from international standards. And so, Challenge is the compulsory detention policies in principle applied in Japan and alternative to detention ATD is quite rare. 
and no judicial review system for the prolonged detention and no maximum period for the detention. So that is a challenge to be left in Japan. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, Yukari, and we really appreciate that you woke up early this morning. So thank you very much for you know, uh, adjusting to the, the time difference. Thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, Afzalur. Uh, so Afzalur, if you want to uh, present your paper, you have 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for giving the floor. <clears throat> and I would like to express my a gratitude uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my experience about uh, one particular study uh, with special reference to the Rohingya refugees who have experienced differently in the last couple of years after the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, in terms of maritime migrations from Bangladesh to uh, by crossing the Bay of Bengal and Amman Sea. With shortly, I'm sharing my slide. My apology for that. I just I I think uh, okay. So uh, what I uh, try to uh, do in my uh, presentation is all about uh, give you a complete pictures of how the particularly one of the persecuted uh, refugees of the world, Rohingyas as they're facing a continuous problem in, in their, in their I mean, camp areas, particularly I say that in Bangladesh. And as since 2017, they're living in very congested and populous camp areas of the world in Bangladesh. So after the outbreak of the COVID-19, so uh, as uh, the, their, they didn't receive, I mean, well sufficient help from the, government and also the international community. So at that time, the trafficking networks utilized that opportunity, uh, that types of uh, opportunities, I, I say that, and, and they simply convinced them to uh, agree with them to travel the Bay of Bengal and Andaman Sea and, and Indian Oceans to uh, Southeast Asia, mainly the Malaysia and Indonesia was their target countries at the time. So the fundamental two objectives of my study is to know the reason of choosing this, this types of perilous journey of maritime migrations. And secondly, I'm, I'm gonna to try to analyze the impact of COVID-19 on the maritime migrations of Rohingya refugees from Bangladesh to Southeast Asia. Mainly I hear a focus on in Malaysia and Indonesia. So I, we know that uh, since 2017, uh, a huge number of Rohingya influxes from Myanmar to Bangladesh. Their number is, according to the government source, and and other information from the UNHCR, their number is 1.1 million. So they're living in uh, some of the camps uh, that border areas of Bangladesh and Myanmar. So the targeted populations are in that camp areas. We, uh, I have in a previous study that I link with my this paper is. In 2013 and 14, when there is in a kind of discourses that is called Andaman Sea Crisis, that time uh, around uh, 1,000 people, mainly the migrant, irregular migrant, died uh, without food and tortures by the, I, I say that uh, different types of uh, migrant networks group uh, and pirates who are involved in this process. They are from Bangladesh, Myanmar. Thailand and an Indian part of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So they tortured the irregular migrant. Uh, later on, uh, the government of Bangladesh and other regional agencies uh, enforced the resilience in there. But right now, uh, the, the number is minimal in terms of the Bangladeshi citizen. But uh, after that, when Rohingyas came in 2017, uh, those networks were active in several countries. They targeted them. And utilize their vulnerabilities uh, in the camp areas. So, and another factors is why they uh, choose uh, these types of dangerous and very risky path of uh, military migration is, uh, 
as previously, uh, Rohingyas have any allegations of utilizing uh, different types of fake documents uh, through getting the passport of Bangladesh and a national ID card of Bangladesh. And later on, they, they just uh, simply uh, uh, travel in the country, mainly uh, the Middle Eastern country, where a strong number of, I mean, I mean a thousand, a millions of Bangladeshis are working as in a labor forces. So Rohingyas utilize that, uh, use that kind of channels uh, through the different uh, different groups. Uh, locally, they're called as an Adala. They're brokers and they give them passport and, and, and IDs and others uh, in exchange of kind of, I say, the money. But uh, in last couple of years, government took uh, biometrics and, and a number of uh, uh, security steps that barred the Rohingyas to get that kind of opportunities. So the reason they have no opportunities to left Bangladesh as uh, their origin country, Myanmar, is so uh, hostile to them. So only options they have opened up is to cross the Bay of Bengal and later on Andaman Sea and, and Indian Ocean. So they took that up, uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, I say that, uh, way of migrating and then that migration is so risky and and, and sometimes it costs their own life so uh uh as in my pub however uh we, we see that after the outbreak of the COVID 19 initially uh the 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 impact of the COVID 19 on the camp areas was kind of as uh documentations and the data was not available initially for us uh, for three and four months. And, and but later on, uh, international agencies, they suspended their activities. And I and, and also other uh, government have, uh, I say that government also uh, imposed the restrictions to move on the camp periods. So th these types of uh, policies without, uh, without taking alternative options to giving them service, emergency service. Uh, feel them kind of deprived, and 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 that times trafficking networks influence them to take to the, those decisions. What I try to say in here, they took that decisions, but when they uh, try to uh, shift in the Myanmar, uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia, two countries uh, who are historically very supportive to the causes of Rohingyas, Rohingya refugees within the Asian forums. Uh, but that times, Myan uh, Malaysia particularly, they denied uh, to receive the Rohingyas because of the COVID-19 uh, kind of protocols or, or kind of fear of spreading the COVID-19 from Rohingya refugees. So they pushed back from their coast and, and, and they stay in, in the sea for, 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 I say that, more than one month. And, and some of them died and some of them uh, starved for long, I mean, so many days, I say the 10 to 15 days. And later on, international agencies specialized Bangladesh, Bangladesh government received some of them uh, from the boat and, 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 and later they transferred them in a, a remote island that is called Basham Surf. So their life in that particular uh, island also not so well. So I, I said, th these are the kind of things that have a strong uh, correlations with uh, COVID-19, how they triggers the vulnerable communities like refugees. Uh, moreover, uh, and, and apart from that, uh, I, I say that uh, if I uh, find this in, in this uh, stage of my presentations, if I say the where, what the Rohingyas, Rohingyas, uh, they are mainly uh, the historical, they are living in Myanmar, but Myanmar government persecuted them for so many years, I say the five and six decades, they systematically persecuted, and and finally they they just uh they, they just systematically became stateless, and now they have to stay. They're sporadic, uh, they're living in uh in in civil state, uh, in Asia, and I say particularly in South Asia, Middle East, and Southeast Asia. So uh and. The places where they're living right now in the camp areas, these are the pictures. You see, the, this is so, uh, I mean, congested and uh, it's not actually possible to live in that particular place. Uh, I mean, uh, without getting some basic facilities uh, as there are so many people are living in that particular place. So these are the pictures. 
uh, of the campus. Uh, the reason why they actually uh, chose these two particular country, the Malaysia and Indonesia, and and, and great extent the Southeast Asia, the uh, in these two countries there is in a I, I say specifically the Malaysia they have a demand of cheap labors and uh, I say that as they, they they attract the investment from the OECD countries and so many industries they shifted their industries in Malaysia. They need cheap laborers. The reason they need cheap laborers, they welcome the, uh, I mean, uh, in, in informal channels, the refugees. So uh, refugees, uh, if they utilize the labors of refugees, then they can utilize, they can, uh, they, they can uh, give them, uh, they can poss possibly able to uh, maximize their productions with cheap labor. Secondly, there is an historical uh, channels of migrations uh, as, Myanmar and, and Bangladesh and, 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 and Malaysia, and these two countries have a colonial history of British uh, control. So uh, there is an historical migrations from British Indian as, as, as Myanmar also the part of the British India. So people uh, moved at that times frequently from one British, uh, I mean, provinces to the other provinces. So Malaysia at that time also people from this part of, uh, I mean, South Asia, mainly the Bangladesh and now the Indian part, travel to the Myanmar and also the Malaysia. So this is another historical, uh, I mean, fact uh, that I found uh, from the literatures. And thirdly, religion is another factor that predominantly most of the Rohingyas are Muslim. So they have been a kind of, uh, kind of uh, desire that if they land in Myanmar, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, both the Muslim countries, they probably sympathize to their cause. So these are the three particular, uh, I mean, causes of choosing uh, these uh, two countries and in, in great extent, the Southeast Asia. And, and the, the route they followed, uh, th this is the road uh, for these irregular migrations. So I already uh, told my research questions. So but the methodology I followed in here that I visited uh, in the camp areas, uh, I mean, in the middle of COVID-19 and I interviewed uh, and uh, over phone, and I talked with the development practitioners and use active and do activities. As I'm academics, uh, I have uh, not always permitted to visit that place. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, during the COVID during COVID time, and as there is you know, COVID protocols and other issues, I contract with them and and induce and and development practitioners. So this is the process. I collect the data. This is monitoring project. So what I found uh, that uh, uh, is the, the, the reason they are desperately try to settle in Malaysia and Indonesia, they haven't related in there. Probably I, 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 I talked to one lady is that her husband is staying in Malaysia. So uh, uh, with two child, she is living in Camp areas. So she was desperate to, I mean, reunite with her husband in Malaysia. So that was the reason he took that decisions with the trafficking ring. Uh, and, and, and secondly, that uh, there are another factors uh, to reunite with uh, their parents and, and another group of people. So th this is the way I, 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 just, uh, I, I just followed. Uh, so this is the pictures. I also utilize some of the theories uh, and try to fit uh, in my, uh, uh, in this project, a particular uh, study one is system and network theory. I, I just uh, applied the network theory in here that how different types of network work in here, uh, mainly uh, when in, in the camp areas, uh, they are frequently contact with different people that they came to know uh, that people are uh, going to Malaysia uh, by utilizing the small boat or uh, I mean, a small ship. So, uh, that, that is the way the influence. Secondly, there are illegal network also active for constantly working in there. And thirdly, uh, the people who are living in, in, in Malaysia and in Indonesia and, uh, and those places, they frequently conduct with them over phone. So this is also working uh, in, in that particular stage. And there are, uh, I, I, I say that in my uh, discussion part, if I summarize uh, my uh, of my findings in this stage, then I say that uh, people uh, in the camp areas, 
as they came to, uh, uh, I mean, Bangladesh in 2070 for a temporary uh, uh, moment, but now it's 2021. So, uh, so uh, after after these three and four years, uh, their aspirations and hope uh, dispired. They desperately uh, want to repatriate with their country, but the process of repatriation is became complex uh, because of the because of uh, because of I say that. Uh, because of it's not working uh, frequently with Myanmar and Bangladesh in their diplomatic tables. So refugees are uh, highly uh, affected by this process. I think, uh, I don't know how many minutes I have or whether I will finish within. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I, I say, uh, these are the process uh, of uh, later harming and, and deteriorating their situations in the camp periods as, as because they have no hope. They're living, uh, I say, the subhuman life in the camp periods. So they're desperately looking for, uh, looking for uh, alternative source of migration, and maritime migration is available in there. And uh, I, I say th these are the places where Bangladesh uh, government relocates some of the refugees. And initially, it was relocated by the Rohingyas, who mainly uh, denied by the mere Malaysian government. In, in, in 2020 during COVID-19 peak time. So uh, I, I, say, I, I say just a couple of recommendations uh, for Bangladesh to work with uh, other regional countries like uh, Myanmar, Thailand, and Malaysia in regional forum. There is an BIMSTEC and ASEAN. Bangladesh is a member of BIMSTEC and Bangladesh can pursue the ASEAN countries. And, and two important player is in here is China and India. Their uh, active support and cooperation is very important for solving uh, these types of problem. And thirdly, the recent uh, uh, military, uh, I mean, co in Myanmar also uh, kind of uh, uh, created some uncertainties of solving this kind of problem. And I think the will and hope of everybody is can solve the despires and and, and 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 I say that uh, the the difficult situations of these refugees were were facing in the camp areas and that leads to the American migrations. With this I conclude my uh, presentation in here. I, I say thank you again uh, to the uh, honorable uh, chair for giving me the chance. It's uh, 70 a.m. in my part of the world so I, I'm not actually uh, so I, I say that so energetic to deliver my space. I, I say sorry for that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Afzalur. Uh, so thank you very much for the, to the three speakers, great presentations. And um, uh, I think it feels, you know, a lot of uh, uh, some blind spots that we may have here in North America. And so I'm very glad that you were able to uh, inform us and share your analysis with us. So now um, I, I would like to um, uh, ask uh, our audience to uh, uh, feel free to ask uh, questions to our speakers. So if you do, please turn on your camera and your mic and uh, go ahead. question yet so maybe uh, I should start with one uh, so I'm going to start to one with you uh, you carry um, if you agree um, so in your presentation you you, you showed uh, basically some problems with the uh, immigration detention system in in, um, in Japan and uh, what is surprising to, to me at least, is that um, with uh, the evolution of the demography in Japan, Japan, I mean, uh, theoretically should welcome more migrants. And so uh, also theoretically, the, the legislation should be a bit more, uh, uh, I think, understanding of the, the migrants. And, and so, but it seems that uh, in one of your slides, you were showing that uh, the public opinion, or at least part of the public opinion, was sympathizing with uh, the detainees. And so my question is about that, the public opinion in Japan. 
where are they? Are they siding with the government or are they siding with detainees or is it more complex than that? Thank you for your question. Your question is, if the expert is uh, in favor of the government or against the government? Yeah, actually the special rapporteur, as well as the working group of arbitrary detention, they clearly state the government uh, act is a violation of international law. So that means declared the Japanese attitude is violating the international law, which is ICCPR and the Convention Against Torture and the other relevant international human rights conventions. And the react of the government was quite interesting. After they got the opinion from the expert and the working group, the Japanese government explained, oh, you misunderstood the fact. So that was uh, not really uh, con con uh, con the uh, direct dialogue didn't really uh, make between the expert and the government. That is uh, quite uh, challenging at this stage. Okay, thank you very much, Yukari. And I have a follow up question because when you mentioned the, the example of death in detention, I was wondering whether those uh, deaths, uh, and you, you, you told the circumstances and they were uh, certainly tragic, uh, were those deaths shared by the mass media in Japan? I mean, was the public opinion, the general population aware of those deaths? Of course, uh, if the death happened, it appeared to the mass communication, mass media, and uh, mass media reported a lot of uh, information. But we cannot really know the, what, what was the main reason why he or she died. For example, the death of the Nigerian guy, he went to on the hunger strike because he uh, was uh, detained for a long time and he was supposed to be deported to Nigeria, but he didn't want to because his uh, family is in Japan. And the uh, Sri Lanka lady, she was not on hunger strike, not intentionally, but she couldn't eat because of her health condition. And she asked to go to see the hospital outside the immigration, immigration detention center, but her request was not uh, accepted by the immigration. So that was quite uh, different from Canada because I went to see the immigration detention center in Toronto many years ago and uh, the medical request was quite easy to accept by the Canada, Canada Immigration Agency. And also NPO, NGO is always, uh, say, they could, the detainee could access to the NGO in the Immigration Detention Center in Canada. So that was the main difference between Canada and Japan. But also, I found the similarity between Japan and Canada, because Canadian system, the detention is not uh, fixed the, the maximum period, like Japan. So that is the main uh, similarity between Canada and Japan. But in the meantime, we have very different, the, especially the treatment in the detainee in the immigration detention center. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yukari. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Uh, I see well you unmuted. So I don't know if you have a question. 
I was just going to ask Yakari, uh, mm -hmm. because I'm studying technologies um, with irregular migrants. Um, do you think uh, irregular migrants in Japan have access to communication technologies like with the outside world? For your question, yeah, actually, if you are detained, you can call by using the public phone, but it's quite uh, expensive. You need to buy the special card, the telephone card, but it's quite costly. And if you are detainee, you cannot receive any call, even from your lawyer. So that is the main uh, dif difficulty, the communication between the lawyer and detainee, for example, and family and detainee. And I heard in the UK, for example, detainee are given the smart, uh, mobile phone and they could communicate with the family abroad. But in Japan, it's impossible. I don't know about Canada situation, if anybody know about Canada situation, if you can communicate with a uh, family or lawyer, if you are detained. Yeah, I, I think they have this possibility here. So uh, with regard to people, uh, to regular migrants in Japan, so how would they communicate with um, like their lawyers if someone doesn't have money? Um, if no money, impossible. But uh, usually the uh, NGO is uh, assisting to provide the uh, uh, telephone card. But the telephone card, for example, like 1,000 yen, which is 10 US dollars, costs uh, like uh, eight minutes. So quite expensive. And there are the 80 minutes phone call is very expensive, in my opinion. Yes, it is. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions for the two other speakers, Vittoria and uh, Afzalur? If you don't, then you let me ask my own questions. Or, or sorry, or maybe before that, or maybe um, are there any questions from speaker to speaker? So sometimes there, there, there are, so just asking. May I ask Afzal about the uh, Rohingya? Many years ago, I went to research about Rohingya situation in Bangladesh. And that time I couldn't go to visit the refugee camp itself because I was told it's not safe. And uh, if I would like to go to uh, research at the camp, which procedure I need to uh, go through. Okay, uh, thank you for your interest in the great questions. And I, I say it's a very complex, uh, uh, I mean, procedures to get the permissions officially uh, as because uh, there is a security concern and, and this place is uh, strictly surveillance by the different uh, law enforcement agencies, including Bangladesh military for the security purpose as because uh, uh, th those are the people who are, uh, I mean, uh, kind of they, they are positioned by, uh, they, they are the more than the local populations of Bangladesh in that particular areas. So uh, there's their security concern. So I think uh, it will take more hassles to get permissions from the foreign ministry. Uh, but I think you'll get, uh, as Japan is a good friend of Bangladesh uh, since 1971. Uh, so I, I think we'll get the permissions. Uh, if you apply in the foreign ministry and they will give you the permissions, I think it's not be, be a big problem for you. Thank you very much. 
I I I think uh, as uh, you're from Japan, I think if you apply the for Ministry of Bangladesh uh, with uh, your proposals, uh, then they will give you the permission. I, I definitely think so, as Japan is one of the very uh, strong allies of Bangladesh since 1971. So I think probably it depends on country to country, right? So I think we'll get the permissions, uh, but. Uh, but it will go through a uh, huge scrutinization as there is a uh, security concern exists in the Rohingya camps. Uh, uh, for the safety of the foreigners, probably uh, government will take more security, uh, I mean, steps to give the permissions. And the respective agency can tell you the more than me as I'm academics. I actually don't know a lot of things about that. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much. Um, so, Isani, I have a, a question for Victoria. Uh, so, uh, thank you for the presentation. And that was an interesting, I think, paradox because uh, you, you, you were uh, at one point talking about the, 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 the state of Rohaima. And, um, uh, and uh, it seems to be from, from the perspective of Brasilia, the capital. Uh, as you said in your presentation, at the same time, very, very uh, far and very close, very close in the sense that you have the boundaries that have been established uh, by the Brazilian diplomacy. Uh, and so Itamarati, although Itamarati is in Brasilia, it's there. I mean, I mean, at least virtually in the, on the boundaries. But at the same time, it's very far from, from uh, Ohaima. And, and, and it seems to me that the distance basically at the same time allows the diplomacy to be absent and, and not to protect uh, families, as you said. So how do you see this paradox? I mean, and, and do you have, for instance, other, mechanism, other mechanisms in the Brazilian Federation that counteract or counterbalance the, this paradox? Yes, thank you, Bruno, for your question. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, Brasilia is quite far from Rhyme. So the operation of reception, the reception operation, they create um, some place in Rhyme where the whole government can work from, that, from there to protect the immigrants, uh, such as um, a person's uh, diplomats from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Justice. So they are able to collect some data from them also. But the, prin the principal connection from Itamari, uh, to Itamariti, uh, from Itamariti to the immigrants to help them are from diplomatic um, ways, uh, such as they are the connection um, they, they are able to connect the federal government and the operation reception, the reception operation to uh, UNHCR, to OINIM and other organizations and entities uh, who works directly in, which works directly in RIMA. So the diplomacy creates a foundation and despite the despite of the difference, uh, the distance, they can uh, work from Rima also. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. And I have a follow up question because so it seems to me that the the, the system you describe is really you know functioning well, etc. I mean, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, but is, is there has there been an evolution or change with uh, the fact that uh, President Bolsonaro came to power or uh, because it's far and maybe there is no politicization of, of, of this topic, then nothing was said and basically Tamarati was able to continue working uh, without any interference. Yes, um, the federal government is essential to coordinate the operation. However, the operation works uh, for itself, such as um, the, the structure 
are, um, are made from people from the ministries. So some of them came from uh, not as not nominee, nominee uh, uh, by President Bolsonaro. So the ministry works um, in the separate ways to the federal government. However, there is an interference uh, and they can directly uh, say uh, and uh, make some orders to the operation. However, how it's, it's working quite well, the, it, not, it, the changes that has been made are for good. However, we can uh, notice from, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ordinances from the federal government uh, were limited the entrance. So the Itamarati uh, send um, uh, official uh, sayings to the public and br to, to Brazilians or uh, internationally, internationally also that they are here to they're here to protect the immigrants and everything. So the changes that have been made are because of the COVID-19 pandemic and they, they limit the border. However, the ministry worked for itself in some ways. So the changes are not quite um, to notice. It is more because of the COVID-19. Okay, great, thank you very much, Victoria. Any other questions? So I have a question for you, Afzalur, if you agree. Um, uh, so, so you mentioned in, in the conclusion, I mean, in the recommendations, your slides with the recommendations to, to, to have uh, more cooperation among countries if I'm correct, in, in the region. And I wanted to ask you if, um, <clears throat> uh, is this cooperation missing because uh, you have interference from other countries or maybe foreign powers? Um, or is it uh, for other, I mean, are there other factors that explain that? The fact that there is no cooperation among countries, okay. not enough. Thank you very much for your, uh, I mean, very interesting questions. The options that given by you is first one, I, I say that correct. As Bangladesh is kind of uh, uh, share, uh, I mean, almost, uh, I mean, 75% uh, of the border with the in India. So, uh, and, 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 and India is an our, uh, I mean, big neighbor. And, but in terms of economic dependency, China is also a big neighbor in terms of economic partnerships. Both of the actors also have extensively involved with Myanmar. Uh, the places where Rohingyas are currently, I mean, displaced, I mean, and that area is heavily invested by the China and India. So they're building, uh, I mean, deep seaport and connectivity with their land. So uh, I think uh, the involvement of these two actors also crucial to solve this problem. And 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 as in as a, as a very, in terms of a small country. Bangladesh sometime uh, cannot be possibly able to egg, I mean negotiate with both of the countries with same tables for solving this problem. I think that's the number one point that you picked. I do agree with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Azul. Uh, okay. If you allow me, then I I, I can ask. One questions to please go ahead. Like yes. To one questions to the, yes. Yeah. Uh, Imperi. Now I, I say that it's midnight at my part, so I, I I'm, I'm not so confident enough to ask the questions. Imperi, I I I'm very, I wanted to know uh, the, uh, the 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 presentation you share with us uh, the the migrant uh, I mean uh, detentions I mean and patterns of migrant in Japan. So uh, I have a general questions I would like to know. So do you think that these types of uh, strategies or activities fundamentally harm the image of Japan as, and, uh, as a Japan is a very, uh, I mean, uh, cooperative country in, in terms of uh, economic ground? So do you think it is fundamentally harming their image 
So if harm, then uh, what can they do in futures to kind of minimizing this type of, this types of low forces? So I think uh, you got my point. If not, then I will repeat again. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, actually, um, Japanese image which you have is maybe different from my image. Okay. Because Japan is, in terms of human rights or uh, legal uh, system, is uh, quite under development. And uh, of course, we did have the uh, economic uh, uh, issue. Uh, it was uh, good, but now the situation in Japan is not that good to compare the uh, previous years. And uh, we need to accept the migrants because uh, we are facing the uh, aging societies. But the uh, people attitude, I mean, the ordinary people in Japan is not prepared to receive the uh, migrant. Regardless, we need uh, to accept. And if the uh, Japanese non Japanese national violate the uh, law or legislation, they are severely punished, like to be detained. And the ordinary people allowed to do so. That is one of the big challenges. We need to change the mind. And uh, this weekend, we do have the national election. And uh, we need to uh, vote for the uh, politicians. And this is, might be changed people's attitude because of the leading party is quite severe to deal with the uh, point. Does I uh, answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I understood what you say. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I don't know, you, Karina, if there, would you have a question for Victoria, perhaps? Um, I, I, I just, uh, if you allow me, then I, I, I want to ask one question to the Victoria. So thank you for the presentations and Yukari and Victoria. So Victoria, I, I, I would like to know uh, about uh, the, I mean, Brazilian diplomacy in terms of uh, whether they have uh, new contributions in terms of uh, uh, giving the remedies to those, uh, I mean, big teams. Uh, I said whether uh, they have any new contributions or whether they're following some existing international mechanisms to dealing with this. As we hear that in our undergrad, Latin America have their own uh, mechanisms to deal with some problems. So I just curious to know that issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the, uh, one of the, the big uh, contributions contributions to diplomacy uh, in Brazil through the years is the connection of the national laws to international conventions. So here in Brazil, uh, we have a pro administrative process to include to um, include international laws into our system, international system of laws. However, the, um, the diplomatic um, diplomats here in Brazil, they act as a connection. They um, bring to the country as a, um, as a fundament those law, international laws. So here in Brazil is a serious 
problem of uh, is a severe problem if they, we do not um, react well or if we, we do not follow the international laws is a big issue because uh, we have some uh, other, we have the pressure for other countries and Latin American countries and for other countries to work and to accept those international conventions that we assigned, that we uh, agreed to participate. So the internet, the Brazilian diplomacy works directly with the federal government to incorporate those human rights and those um, things that we have to implement in our operations. Uh, what we do know now about the reception operation, the biggest and the main operation here in Brazil, we received a lot of influence from operations uh, from other countries and for, from international conventions, such as here in Brazil, when the immigrant, uh, mainly the Venezuelan immigrant uh, comes to Brazilian borders, they receive now the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine uh, since the, the first months of the, this year. And there's a, pro, a, health, there's a, a health problem because if we do not do that, that might uh, be bad for the whole country. However, that uh, human, human rights issue that we've signed in some international conventions about health and other aspects. So we do now know that the Brazilian diplomacy has a connection of international conventions uh, that we have to follow because we signed for it, we agreed to, to it, and the federal government. And that's important to guarantee human rights in those operations to, res res um, to respect the immigrants and refugees in Brazil. Thank you, Isafur. Uh, so, so you can. Yeah, actually, uh, related to this question, I would like to ask Victoria. Um, if, uh, if I'm not wrong, the Brazil is a member of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And uh, how the Inter-American Court of Human Rights work in Brazil? And if the uh, diplomacy is related to the system of OAS or not? That's my question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Ugari. Uh, here, yes, Brazil is a member of the um, this court, and diplomacy is essential to Brazil um, because Brazil was um, sued. He uh, was um, condemned. Um, they did not follow some rules from the convention. So in prisons, uh, a lot of human rights issues. So the convention um, imposed restricted restrictions that Brazil had to follow to agree with the human rights that he, he agreed before in the conventions. So the diplomacy is essential to make sure that Brazil uh, follow those uh, restriction, restrictions and do not um, have problem without uh, the, uh, the Brazilian the federal government or the secretaries of the cities, the secretaries of the states uh, do not uh, accept those uh, restrictions from the convention because if they do not do that, the whole country will suffer the consequences internationally. So that's the main point of diplomacy related to the, this convention and this court. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And I had a follow-up question uh, to, to the question that Azalur had asked you, Vittoria. And on top of international conventions, you have also, it seems to me, uh, regional uh, agreements such as the Mercosur, etc., that allow people to move freely, a little bit like the, you know, the four freedoms in Europe, blah, blah. Um, but it seems to me that you have this, you know, basis also of 
and a, a huge tradition of uh, regional cooperation among uh, Latin American countries that partly is related to the sort of common Latin culture, uh, also this, the common civil law uh, <clears throat> that the, 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 the countries share. And, and also this, this uh, uh, it seems to me, this, this um, uh, the importance given to international law to avoid conflicts. And this is something that is uh, shared among Latin American countries. I mean, they, the diplomacy, I mean, Brazil is one of them. I mean, it's one of the most powerful countries in terms of diplomacy and Itamarati is a, a fantastic administration for that. But you have also all the other uh, diplomatic administrations that work uh, together. And so you have, I mean, it seems to me this strength of Latin America, which is to, to have this regional cooperation supported by uh, great diplomacy. So it, it's a statement and a question at the same time, because I'm not sure if it's correct or not. Well, thank you, Bruno. It's quite correct. Um, here uh, in Latin America, we have the Mercosur, the is a convention. Um, it's supposed to be a pre Texas. Um, relation mainly it started mainly with um, economic conditions however now it expanded through the years to the last decade um, to the respect to human rights uh, immigrants refugees however um, venezuela is not part anymore of the Mercosur because of democratic clause that has the the convention the um, agreement has so it was not it is not the country is not able to participate anymore so here in Brazil we have um, bilateral um, it, it it was before a bilateral agreement with Venezuela. Uh, however, the, there is a tension between the the, uh, the two presidents, the two nations. So it is more an ordinance uh, from Brazil that states that the refugees uh, that state the refugee status to all the immigrants came came in from Venezuela, and about the other countries as eighty. It works the, the same way. We have an ordinance, um, especially and to agents. However, when we were talking about the other countries, such as Uruguay and Argentina, we have this connection through uh, with um, based on the Mercosur. And but overall, the mainly connections here in Latin America that Brazil is part concerning immigrations and refugees. It's more a bilateral uh, convention. Of course, uh, always structured and based on the international conventions and the laws of the, their countries, their countries. So that's really it, um, thank you. I hope I answered the question. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Um, are there any questions? I have another one for you, Carrie, otherwise. Sorry, so you, you, you mentioned that uh, the ordinary population was not necessarily ready to welcome immigrants. And so that's, of course, a huge problem. At the same time, if Japan has not been uh, traditionally a country of immigration, uh, that can be quite problematic. So how do you see, uh, how can the government or even civil society organizations influence uh, Japanese people to be more welcoming toward migrants? Do you see some possibilities or is it something that is very complicated? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, I'm thinking how we can change the people's mind. But um, as you mentioned, Japan is not used to receive the migrants. 
And even the government's official statement says we are not migrant country, even we receive a lot of foreigners. So that is a very contradiction in reality and the government official statement. And also the ordinary people attitude is quite uh, uh, challenging as well. Unlike Canada, we don't have the neighbor from all over the world. And uh, probably one of the things I can recommend is that we can uh, organize to connection with the people. And uh, I saw the one good example in Toronto they receive uh, irregular migrants at the community. In the beginning, they had a lot of problems because of the people are kind of afraid to receive the irregular migrants. But they organized a festival together. And then from time to time, they could know each other. And then uh, the, uh, the ordinary people are not afraid of the foreigners anymore. So even Canada, some people are afraid of irregular migrants. But uh, if they do something together, they got to know each other. So that is one of the uh, first steps. Maybe we can organize something in Japan, like a festival together. And then people change my, uh, their mind, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, for Canada, it has been uh, also a lot of work, and it I think it's, it's taken generations. I mean, I mean, when you see the 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 focus of immigration, I mean, European immigration, until the 1960s, 70s, and then uh, some changes of you know of immigration to be more inclusive uh, from uh, I mean at least from an ethno-racial. Uh, perspective, but uh, Canada is selecting now based on the socioeconomic status. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not perfect. But, but yeah, that, that, that's not bad, bad. Yeah. Yeah, I would like to about yeah. educational system. No, but Stephanie is there. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Danielle? Okay. So, Daniel, I'm going to mute you because I don't know if you were. Okay, so sorry. Uh, sorry, go, go ahead, you're coming. Okay, no, I, I mean, at the university level, maybe uh, the students can eat, uh, know each other because of the international students. And uh, if I look at Japanese situation, still the Japanese students are hesitated to. Uh, talk with international students. And the international students seem to be isolated from uh, uh, local students. So I'm always thinking how they can interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Because, it, yeah, so if you have any tips, please let me know. No, 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 but you have, yeah, you're right to mention that. I mean, in, in Canada, the, the, the fact that we have international students in our universities and some of them deciding to stay in Canada, and it's basically supported by policies uh, from the government. So basically, the idea is to allow international students, if they decide to stay in Canada, to facilitate uh, the transition. And so you, you have, uh, yeah, so some possibilities uh, offered to students because the idea is that they, they are going to spend uh, a few years as students, they're going to know the culture, they are going to <clears throat> you know, uh, establish some roots, uh, have connections, etc. And so, uh, and generally they study, but they also start working. So, so basically it's a form of uh, you know, pathway towards uh, a longer uh, immigration path. So it, it's in like that. Yeah. All right, I see that we are going to have, uh, you know, um, uh, the end of our uh, panel. So thank you very much, uh, Victoria, Yukari, and uh, Absalur.
for your presentations, also the great conversation we had. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, have a great day or great good night. Uh, <laughs> so, so great day you carry and as uh, have a good night. Unless you are going to party right now, I don't know. Uh, and uh, Victoria, thank you very much as well. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank